Sean Finnegan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. In this third and final interview with Will Barlow, we'll spend some focused time looking at Malachi chapter 3 to understand what this passage meant in its original context. You know Malachi chapter 3, right? Will a man rob God? That famous saying we're going to look at and see how it relates to us today. Next, we'll take a look at three myths about Christian giving. Lastly, Barlow will share four keys to Christian giving with us that I think will really help all of us to really ask ourselves the question, how am I doing in this area? How can I do better in this area? What does God want me to do? Here now is part three of our series, number 386, Christian Giving Today with Will Barlow. Well, welcome back, Will Barlow. So glad to have you on the show again today. Thanks for having me again, Sean. Uh, you know, there's this one text that we hear preachers use all the time, and it's from Malachi chapter 3. I, I had mentioned it previously, but it says, Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. And uh, But you say, How have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, your tithes and offerings. Malachi 3, 8, and, uh, you know, the context around that. And so this is such a, uh, an important and common verse to use on this subject, and you really haven't addressed it here. So let's let's go there. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. What's your interpretation of Malachi chapter three? So you know Malachi three, it has a lot uh, a lot going on there, and so I think it's important. I'll actually go ahead and read some of it from eight to twelve, and then we'll talk about some of the specific language uh, that's being used here, and then the context. Um, So I'll just start by reading it. And it absolutely is the elephant in the room. This is the number one tithing passage in the Bible and very dramatic. Like you said, Malachi 3, 8, will will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions or offerings? Like you said, you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may, may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, said, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour out down a blessing uh, for you, a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. So like I said, there's a lot going on here, a very powerful passage about uh, the benefits of tithing in this Old Testament context. Um, And so like you said, a lot of modern preachers, they will come here and they will apply this directly to the church. We've already seen a little bit um, a couple episodes ago about the greater context of the tithe, um, how it was was food uh, and how it was uh, not, not all Israelites did it. I think those things will help us as we go through the text here. Um, So how should we handle this text? And I would say we've got to handle it with very special care, being very careful about the wording, about the context, about specifically what's being said. Um, So I've got several points on that. Uh, The first one is the context of Malachi 3 is in the context of the sacrificial system, which has been done away with in Christ. We, We mentioned couple times ago that if Abraham, for example, Abraham tithed and he also did these other offerings, well, if he did all of that, then why don't we still apply the all of that today? Well, in Malachi 1, uh, it talks about, in verses 6 through 8, it talks about all sorts of different sacrifices, offering food food upon the altar, uh, offering blind animals in sacrifice. So that's the context we're talking about here. We're talking about all these different sacrifices, Uh, In Malachi 3 specifically, in verse 8, it doesn't say that whatever people are being referenced here robbed God just in tithes. It says in your tithes and your contributions, and other translations have offerings there. And so if you look at that word uh, offerings, uh, there's just a a whole bunch of usages in the Old Testament. You can see that it applies to all sorts of different things. 
And so the, the first point that I'd like to make is that this is clearly in the context of the sacrificial system. And so we have to be careful about how we apply this, uh, if we apply it at all, to the church. All right, so, so your first point, we have to read Malachi in its canonical context. And what I mean by that is where we find this book of the Bible in the Bible. And uh, there's no Bible out there that's not going to have this book in the Old Testament, right, before the coming of Christ. And so we're dealing with that whole system that you laid out two episodes ago, where you have the tithe of the herd and of the harvest and the third-year tithe for the poor and the, the Levites and everything else, and then you have all these other free will offerings. I mean, this is we're talking about the sacrificial system. That's the context, the historical, canonical context of Malachi chapter 3. So this is, this is not just a text, then, that we can grab and excerpt out and read as if it is a principle for all time. However, I think you would agree that the behavior of the Israelites here is something that God would condemn for all time. Yes. Yeah, we should give our best to God, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, we can learn from it, but we can't one-to-one apply it to our situation today because we're on the other side of Christ and things have changed as far as the systems that God uses to relate to his people and for us to relate to each other. That's exactly right. All right, what else? So the second concern that I have about this is that I don't think that we should necessarily assume that Malachi 3 is talking about the general population of Israel. And the reason why I say that is because at least chapter 1 and chapter 2 seem to be addressed specifically to the Levites and the priests. So in Malachi 1 verse 6, for example, uh, it specifically mentions talking to the priests. And then you get to Malachi 2, verse 1, and it says, And now, O priests, this command is for you. And as you read, if you read through Malachi chapter 2, you'll find that the pronoun you refers to the priests, and the pronoun they refers to the people all throughout that entire context. Oh. And so you see that the priests are being condemned for not completing the task that God wanted them to complete in the way that God wanted them to be completed. So are we really supposed to believe that by the time we get to Malachi 3, we have all these things that the priests and the Levites, they're doing incorrectly when it comes to sacrifices and and all this. We get to Malachi 3 and all of a sudden God's going to rake the people over the coals for not bringing enough food for the priests and Levites. In the context, it doesn't sound like that's the problem. It sounds like they have plenty of stuff for sacrifices. It's just they're not doing a very good job of doing what God wants them to do with those sacrifices. And so when I see Malachi 3, I think we got to look at the context. And in, in 1 and 2, it seems to be very clear that, that God is addressing the Levites and the priests in Malachi very directly. Okay. That's an interesting point you make there about the you and the they there, uh, because that is certainly the way this language comes across. So when it says in chapter 3, verse 8, Will man rob God, yet you are robbing me, the you there is talking about the priests. I believe it is. I okay. believe it is. The whole nation of you. It doesn't say the whole nation, period. It says the whole nation of you. And throughout right. that whole context, you is referred to the priests. Right. And so in verse 10, when it says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, that is something that the priests would actually do, right? That they would be receiving it, and then they would be the ones putting it in the mm-hmm. storehouse, Uh, I I had always read this as referring to the Israelites. Right. You're saying this refers to the priests. That's definitely a different point of view than I had seen before. What else do you see here as far as this text goes? So with those two contextual considerations in hand, um, there are four specific things about this text that I think are important. Um, The first is the use of the term storehouse. Um, And I believe that this is a strong indicator, like you were just saying, that the primary audience here is the priests and Levites. Uh, One of the things that most people don't know about the tithe is that uh, the priests actually did not tithe. The Levites did tithe. 
So when people brought the tithes to the Levites, uh, they actually tithed of that amount and they set that aside for the priests. I see. That's, just, I think, a lot of what the use for the storehouse was. Um, so that the priests who were cycling through the rotations in Jerusalem would have the opportunity to get food as they had need. Uh, bringing the tithes into the storehouse, that's like you said, that's something that only a Levite or a priest would do. Hmm. But that's not something that the people would be responsible for. That use of the word storehouse to me uh, takes special consideration. Nehemiah 1038 is instructive on that. Uh, it talks about the Levites bringing the tithes for the priests uh, in Nehemiah 1038. And it's possible that, that this storehouse is similar or maybe identical to the chambers that are mentioned in that Second Chronicles 31 record. We talked about Hezekiah uh, earlier in a prior interview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me read that out. Nehemiah 1038, And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithes. So that's an oversight right there. So you, right. you have the, the priest watching over. Of course, there would be lots and lots of Levites, and yeah. only a, a small percentage of Levites were of the house of Aaron and would qualify as being priests as well. These priests are like special Levites that are given this role, and they're overseeing the Levites receiving the tithes. And it says, And the Levites shall bring up the tenth of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. And it goes on to get very specific about the grain, the new wine, the oil, and the utensils and whatnot. So that's, that's a very helpful text to, to bring in. Mm -hmm. uh, what else do you see here in Malachi 3? Uh, let's set that aside for a second. Let's just say for a second, you know, I'm not buying that this is talking about just the priests and Levites. We're going to bring all of Israel into view for a moment here. Even if the whole nation of Israel is in view here, what should Christians do about the end of verse 8? Because the end of verse 8 doesn't just say that God was robbed in tithes. If it stopped there, maybe the tithe teaching could extend into the church. We could make some minor modifications to make it work post-sacrificial system and, and that sort of thing. But Malachi 3.8 says that God was robbed in tithe and in, in contributions or in offerings as other translations give. And like I said earlier, it's really important to do a study on that word for contributions or offerings. And if you do that, what you'll find is it's used in all sorts of different offerings and contributions. It's used with burnt offerings. It's used sin offerings. It's used all over the place. If, if we're going to use Malachi 3 to teach tithing, then again, I have to ask the question that I've asked before. Why wouldn't we also teach these other offerings? Right. Makes perfect sense. So you're saying it stands together or it falls together. You can't cherry pick out one aspect and preserve it for today. Well, I, I think the, uh, the, the response would be, well, because Abraham tithed. Or because Jacob tithes, but you've already addressed that, that what Abraham did wasn't really what we would call a tithe today. Uh, he did give 10%, but it was only once, and it was only because it was the spoils of war. And uh, Jacob's tithe, we haven't even talked about that, but that's a, a real strings-attached kind of maneuver where he says, well, if you bring me back and everything works out and you give me a good life, then I'll give you 10%. <laughs> you know? yeah. And it's like... Man, I don't think we really want that to be our standard either. No. Keeping that in mind, what, what else do you see here in uh, Malachi 3? So the, the third thing that's important to look at is the use of cursed language here in Malachi 3. And that, again, to me, puts this in a very legal context. So like, for example, in, in Malachi, it says, you are cursed with a curse. Uh, for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. So using that terminology of, of cursing, you know, that, that echoes uh, the blessings and the curses from Deuteronomy and, and other things, provisions under the law. And so this is clearly, I think, an Old Covenant or an Old Testament uh, issue, something that was under the legal framework of the time. And it, it says specifically in Galatians 3.10 that the curse of the law has been done away with in Christ. And so I would just say that there's been a, a big break between uh, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant and the provisions under the Old Covenant and the provisions under the new covenant, and that this curse language is just a very clear indication that this belongs under the law of Moses. Again, in like you said earlier, in the canonical place where we find it. Yep. Deuteronomy 28, the curses, you know, this is a very much a part of the old covenant. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think we really have, do we have curses in the new covenant? I, I don't know any curses. I mean, covenant I think, disobedience. 
There will we have be curses? Of teeth for those who don't enter into the new covenant. Yeah, I don't think we really do. I've never asked myself that question before. <laughs> uh, I, I would say the closest probably would be that bloke in 1 Corinthians 5 that was uh, engaging in an in, in, inappropriate relationship with his father's wife, and Paul cast him out, deliver him to Satan, right? Mm-hmm. That sounds like a curse. But the goal w- is redemptive, you know, for yeah. the destruction of his flesh so that he may be saved ultimately. So you're saying the curse language itself indicates that this is a Torah context. Uh, very good. What else do you have here? The, the last thing, and I think this is also really important, you know, we talked about in the first interview how most people think about the tithe in modern times as being monetary and being, like you said, a flat percentage. And what we found, and if you look through all the records in the Old Testament, you see that it's essentially food products, it's crops, and it's, it's animals. So you look at the specific words used in Malachi 3, you have words that put this in a specific time and a place and a location with a specific product. For example, you have words like food and you have my house. Um, So look, this is all fitting in with what we've seen about the tithe in the first interview. Food was uh, what the tithe was essentially limited to, what the offerings in in a larger sense were limited to. uh, Like I said, uh, crops and animal products. Um, And then my house, it's limited to uh, the temple. It's limited to the time of the sacrificial system. Uh, many, many rabbis will even limit this to the land of Israel. So like if you were a Jew living under the law, but you you like lived in Egypt for whatever reason, you wouldn't tithe even off of that because it wasn't grown in the land of Israel. Hmm. And so we have we have time and we have we have a legal context here and we have you know limited by food products and we have limited to the temple. And that's why I built the definition of tithe I gave in the first episode the way that I did. And here you see Malachi 3 echoing that language throughout this passage, echoing those provisions specifically. When I first was thinking about this subject some years ago and asking myself the question, is tithing for New Testament Christians? One of the questions that I was curious about was, what do Jewish people do today? And interestingly enough, they don't tithe. <laughs> and it's like, well, wh- why don't they tithe? They're, well, they're like, well, there's no temple. The There are no Levites. They're, like, what are we supposed to do with it? Uh, now, of course, Jewish people do support their local synagogues and their local rabbis, and uh, they do it through a totally different system that they were able to develop over time, where they buy seats in the synagogue, and they have free will contributions, of course, as, as well, but uh, they don't tithe. So it's, it's, it's kind of funny that Jews stopped tithing once the temple was destroyed, and then Christians today are like, well, we're tithing because we see it in the Old Testament, and the Jews are like, well, we're actually following the Old Testament, and we're not doing it. You know, So there's a real irony there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I actually just reached out to a friend of mine uh, this week and asked him, because uh, I'd read about the same thing that you'd read about. Um, and maybe you've talked to people too. I don't know. But but I asked him, he grew up in a synagogue. And I said, hey, did your parents ever give 10% or, you know, what was the arrangement? And he said, he said the same thing you said. He said they had a like a membership fee that they would pay based on the size of their household and that there was encouragement of giving around the high holidays. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was always taught in the context of, he gave me the Hebrew word, I, I'm forgetting it, but um, charity was a, essentially the translation of it. And so I said it was basically, you know, free will giving, right? And he said, yes, it was free will giving. And he said, and then I asked him, was it anywhere close to 10%? And he said, nope, nowhere close to 10%. <laughs> um, and so he said, even the membership fee, if you were struggling, um, if your family was out of work for whatever reason, and you couldn't pay for your membership fee for that year for the synagogue, um, they would have accommodations for that. So even that could be worked around for the people who are less fortunate in the synagogue. Hmm. So it's really interesting. Wow. There's definitely an irony there <laughs> where we're trying to follow the law that the Jews are not trying to follow. <laughs> so what else uh, would you say to the modern church today about giving and tithing? Transitioning from Malachi 3 and to the general subject of how do we live this out today, I think that's that's the most important question for, for all of us, really. 
And my, my one sort of tagline is the modern church should encourage free will giving in every category of life with liberality and joy. That's what I, I believe in. And I think, um, is the most biblical from, from what I can read and gather from the scriptures. I have uh, three myths about Christian giving, and then I have four keys to Christian giving. And then I, um, then we can talk about Luke 16, which I know uh, we're both eager to discuss. So when I think about myths about Christian giving, thinking about my background specifically, one of the things a lot of people think is that Christians are in debt to God. Um, that that first 10% is their debt, and that beyond that, that's where free will giving really begins. Ironically, there's a little bit of truth in it, uh, because our our lives are not our own. I mean, God, Paul talks about that in multiple places, how we've been bought with a price. Uh, God bought us back into his kingdom. and mm-hmm. But in spite of that, uh, the the language of the New Testament is not a language of debt. It's not a language of Uh, obligation, especially in the category of financial giving. We definitely want to, as we talked about already, we want to recognize that God has given us everything that we have from our very basic life and breath, all the way to our finances, uh, to our abilities that we can offer uh, in service to others. And I think we definitely have uh, every reason to honor him by having a heart open uh, to giving to others as the need and the opportunity arise. But again, I point to 2 Corinthians 9. It's very clear that New Testament giving um, is about freedom and joy. It's not about compulsion. It's not about law. It's not about debt. That, in a sense, would eliminate the whole idea of guilt, that you, you feel terrible because you forgot or because you felt that you couldn't afford it or that you, you know, so, that some other situation came up where you were not able to give. And uh, you're saying, well, you you're not in debt in, anyhow. You're you're, but it seems like you said you are in debt, but you're not in debt. Are you in debt or not? What are you saying? <laughs> I'm saying we're not in debt. We're not in debt. Okay. Well, we do we do in some sense owe everything to God. We owe our lives to God, our yeah. eternal lives. Uh, you know, everything we recognize that everything uh, that we have has been given to us by God. Uh-huh. But it's not a language of debt. It's not a language okay. of obligation. It's it's a free will interaction. Okay. And what's your second point on this? A lot of people believe that Christians essentially have to pay for God's protection, that that the tithe in some way covers them uh, from certain spiritual attacks in the financial realm or in the sometimes even in the spiritual realm. I just think that this view is um, is very difficult for me uh, because it's never once in Scripture mentioned like that. I mean, you have Malachi 3 rebuking the devourer. I, I, I get that. We've already seen that that's in a very legal Old Testament limited context, and the um, devourer is not the devil e- either, right? Because no, the, the devourer, devourer is, uh, is something that eat gobbles up the crops, right? Yep. Yeah. So, what so do you think our, the devourer is? I agree with you that, that the devourer in that context is you know creatures, you know b- bugs and uh, diseases of that you know some sort. Yeah. yeah. So God, you know, we we don't want to view God as like a, a mafia boss who, uh, you know, he requires his ten percent cut. Uh, before he goes to work in our lives. We just don't see that anywhere in the New Testament. We don't even really see that in Malachi 3, uh, especially seeing in the context of just being limited to the priests and Levites. Um, And, you know, I think it's important uh, to have a more holy orbed view of suffering and of the spiritual competition and, and spiritual warfare. For example, you look at Paul's life. You know, he was obviously walking with God. The man got attacked all the time. And he was giving his all to God. I mean, his whole life was in dedication and service to God. So if the tithe worked or if some minimum amount of giving would would have worked and would have protected him, he wouldn't have had the life that he had. Uh, I mean, the experience of the New Testament just completely nullifies this idea. Um, You know, we we sometimes come under various attacks for various reasons. Uh, This world is not perfect. Uh, We're in a spiritual war. But giving financially is not correlated anywhere in the New Testament with God's protection. And, and I would say it's even foreign to the concept of what's mentioned in Malachi 3. Mm-hmm. That certainly is the pagan mindset outside of Christianity in the first century. In the Greco-Roman world, people believed they had to show due honor and properly care for the gods. And 
this involved finances. It involved observing special days. It involved offering sacrifices. And the mindset was not, oh, because I love this God so much. The mindset was, if I don't show due respect to the gods in the prescribed way, with the professional priest butchering the animal in just the right way and observing the entrails and everything else, that this god is going to mess with our city. And this was a major issue for early Christians where they were not attending the sacrifices anymore. They were not participating in the the cult of Artemis or the other gods. We see it right in the New Testament even, uh, but certainly in the second century as well, where Christians suffer persecution because they're, they're just not buying into that system at all. That's the counterfeit. That's the idolatrous system. That's not the way God talks about giving, whether in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. What else do you have under, under myths about Christian giving? The third myth that I haven't discussed to this point is um, some people believe, in, including the church I grew up in, that, like I said, the first 10%, that covers your like material financial prosperity. But if you give abundant sharing, if you give above 10%, that's where you might get additional benefits. And it's usually couched in like mental or spiritual category of life. And I just want to be absolutely clear that the gifts of God cannot be purchased with money. Uh, There's no amount that you can give to the poor, to ministers, to missions, to your local church, to uh, whatever organization you think is doing God's work. There's no way you can give enough money and expect that you're going to suddenly become a minister like a prophet, or you're going to get X or Y or Z spiritual vision or guidance. Or I mean, look, Acts 8 is very clear about this. The gifts of God cannot be purchased with money. <laughs> you know, uh, Simon the Sorcerer was was there. He tried it. It didn't work out for him. No, it did not uh, go well. <laughs> so there is a gift of generosity mentioned in Romans 12. Okay. That's a spirit-led, God-given gift. That's not, you can be so generous that eventually God gives you a gift, like the gift of generosity or something like that. It is something that God leads, spirit-led. It's not something you can procure with money. Mm -hmm. So we've got these three myths that you've uh, dealt with. Christians are not in debt to God. We're not paying off God so that he protects us, and we are not purchasing God's gifts with our finances. Uh, These are all negatives that you're saying we shouldn't believe. Give us some positives. What are some keys for Christian living? Here here are some keys. Uh, Number one, going back to what we saw uh, in the life of David, everything that we have from our finances to our abilities, everything is God's. Um, We're only giving back to God what he already gave to us. Um, And so when I think about this category, this key, This is where I say that I don't want to limit people if they can't give much financially right now. You know, imagine you're a college student. You know, imagine if you're a single mom, um, if you're someone who has a lot of debt and you feel like you can't give the amount financially that maybe you'd want to be able to give. Maybe you'd want to be able to give five or 10 percent or more of, of your income. And you just you can't do that for whatever reason. That's when you give of what you have. You know, you have abilities, you have talents, you have Uh, ways that God works in you that are unique to you. And those are the things that we can always look to give, always look to serve other people and love uh, in those, in those categories. Every single one of us, whether we have a lot of financial means or not, we all have something to give in service to the gospel. Mm -hmm. My second key is when we are in a position to give financially, uh, when we do give financially, I think it's important to keep in mind the biblical precedent for giving. And I borrowed this, I modified this somewhat from Locke here. Um, It's to support ministers, to support missions work, and to help the poor and those in need, especially among the community of faith. When we do have the opportunity and and the means to give financially, those are the things we can keep in mind. Supporting ministers, supporting missions work, and helping the poor especially among believers. That's the clear New Testament pattern when it comes to giving. Okay. The third key that I would offer up at this point is that as we follow Jesus and as we follow the example of faithful disciples throughout the New Testament, we'll we'll develop an attitude of service, an attitude of liberality, uh, a mindset of giving, however you want to term that. That's what fuels the amount given. 
it's our responsibility to sort of pursue God and pursue the things of God and the things of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we do that, as we cultivate that mindset over time, we'll find ourselves just naturally giving more. And I don't mean naturally in like a five senses way. I mean that we get so used to walking by the spirit in the category of giving that it just becomes very easy for us to see where there's a need and see where God is supplying uh, that need in our lives to give to others, whether that's financial or whether that's another category of life. And that attitude really leads to a, an inward uh, motivation of generosity. It's an inward um, inward levels of, of giving and, and generosity that will be previously unprecedented in our lives. I mean, it, it will take us to new heights and new levels of being generous and of seeing that borne out in the fruit of our lives. It's really exciting when you think about it, when you think about encouraging people from a pastoral standpoint who maybe they don't haven't given much or maybe they in their old man uh, sort of lifestyle, they were takers or they, you know, they, they always look at what's best for them to help them get other minded, to help them get focused on the things of others, as it talks about throughout the New Testament. It's a powerful thing and it completely can change someone's life to flip that switch from going to looking on their own things to looking on the things of others. So you would you would agree with the old idea that giving, you know, whether it's a tithe or more or less, uh, that giving financially is a really important part of discipleship such that it gives you an opportunity to put your faith and trust in God as your provider over your own abilities, for example. Would you agree with that way of thinking about it? Absolutely. And I would point to that record with Hezekiah that we talked about earlier, where I don't think it's accidental that the people saw Hezekiah's example of giving, then they go out and tear down the altars, and then they come back and they give of their own. There's some spiritual truths there that are absolutely you know, powerful. Giving is definitely a part of our discipleship process. It's part of us growing in Christ, and that includes financial giving as well as giving in other categories. And just just for clarity, I was just thinking uh, some people might be curious about you personally, Will, and your situation, uh, and that this is all some elaborate scheme for you to get people to give to you uh, and to your ministry. Tell people tell people what you do for a living right now. I I am an actuary for a large health insurance company uh, that's in, uh, and I live in Louisville, Kentucky. And so I work, uh, I work essentially a nine to five job from home because of COVID and I crunch numbers all day. Uh, right. <laughs> so you, you're not, the... you're not in full-time ministry. Uh, I'm hoping that you will be in full-time ministry in the future here. Uh, <laughs> but as it is right now, you're not, you're not trying to line your pockets with this whole spiel about giving. You're, you're, you're setting out principles that you yourself are following as you give and uh, that this is not some scheme of yours. Just just in case there's a cynic listening in, they're like, oh, man, this guy's slick. At the end of this episode, we're going to get a little link where we can donate to Will. Um, <laughs> that's not where you're coming from here. Not at all. Not okay. At all. Just wanted to clarify that because, you know, I think it's easy to get— because it is such a sensitive topic that it it's easy to get accusatory with it. Uh, what's your fourth key for giving? My fourth key is that God works in the financial category. It's one of the ways that he teaches us how to walk with him. Luke 16 to me is is just a classic example of this, especially verses 10 through 12, but really the whole chapter is instructive on this whole topic. But in Luke 16, 10 through 12, it talks about the one being faithful in least is the one who will be faithful in much. Well, what the context is talking about, that whole context is talking about finances and about, you know, different ways that people use finances. You've got a parable that happens before and a parable that happens answer after, and they both handle for the financial category. And so what, what Luke 16, 10 through 12, which is just in the middle of those two parables is teaching us is, is that as we're faithful to God in the financial category, that opens up more for us spiritually and again, I want to be very clear. This is not tit for tat. This is not pay to play. This is not, I give my money, then God does X, Y, or Z. What I'm saying is as we build this attitude of generosity and as we grow in our discipleship, the financial category is one of those that God really uses because it's so tangible. It's so close to our hearts, uh, you know, letting go of that dollar or that $10 or that $100 or whatever it is. It's meaningful to us because it represents our time. It represents 
our work. It represents our effort. And like you said, to recognize that you're putting God first, that you're honoring him, uh, that he's the one who provided that for you. And that, you know, you believe in what whatever organization you're giving to or whatever person is you're giving to, uh, you believe in them and you want to support them and encourage them uh, and further their goals as the spirit leads you. That's what Luke 16, 10 is talking about, 16, 10 through 12. And what's ironic about this is teaching tithing does the opposite. It gives people a law and a checkbox. And if they're, if they're well enough off to be able to follow that checkbox, then they feel good about themselves and they feel like they've done enough. And if they aren't good enough, if they ha- don't have enough money this month to do a tithe, or if they uh, have a medical bill come up for whatever reason, and they can't check off that checkbox, and they feel like they're unworthy, that they haven't even done the minimum that God wants them to do. And all the while, all God wants us to do is to fully partner with him in this category of life, like he wants us to fully partner with him in other categories of life. Mm-hmm. You're saying that, first of all, we're stewards of God's resources and that God owns it all. Secondly, you're saying that that giving financially isn't just to one thing. It's it's for ministers, it's for missions work, it's for the poor, it's for other situations in need. Uh, I think evangelism is another category where, where giving can really play, which is just missions at home. That's all evangelism is, right? Um, so it's not just it's not just uh, giving to the poor, it's not just giving to the church, but it's it's really both of those. Uh, your third point is that as we do this, there's a an attitude of service, an attitude of generosity. There's a there's a sort of blessing that you get when you give. I've experienced that many times in my life, giving uh, to causes or to individuals in need. In fact, as a ministry, Rest Studio is not it's not very big as far as like the dollar amount. But we were able to give to uh, a situation last year. Uh, where somebody was in in need, and uh, I don't really want to get into specifics, but we were able to step in, and it's like well, you feel good when you do that, when you help somebody, and you know I think that's a built-in component that God uh, puts in there. In fact, doesn't Paul quote Jesus as saying it's more blessed to give than to receive? So you know there is a blessing built into it. And then your last point here about the um, walking with God side of things that this really does open up for us, because it is a step of faith, it does enable us to walk with God in other ways. Maybe you could clarify that fourth point a little bit more for me. Yeah. Maybe summarize it. Yeah, looking at Luke 16, we just see faithful and least leads to faithful and much, and he's least is the financial category, and the most is spiritual things. And so the idea is, as we develop in our discipleship, as we trust God in giving in all categories of life, it's, it's sort of cyclical and it's, it, it's sort of like a spiral staircase where it's cyclical and you're always ascending. You're ascending upward and upward and upward and you're learning more about how God works with you and you're learning more about how you can serve others in your local community, both your community of faith and, and the, those around you as well. You're, the, like I said, you're loving your neighbor as yourself uh, in your local community. And so Uh, There's just, there's a lot to it, but basically as simple as I can make it is that it's just a process where as you, as you grow in this category, you can see how God works with you in other categories as well. Uh, Let's, let's just dip our toes into the dark side for a moment, shall we? What about abuse? What about pastors that embezzle? What about celebrity ministries where the leader is living an opulent lifestyle What about Ravi Zacharias, where so many people contributed so much, and then it turned out he was in in inappropriate sexual relationships? What about all of that? Yeah, I mean, I think think there are things that we can know. There are things that we can discern, and there are things that we may not be able to know or discern at a certain period of time. Um, You know, for example, with the Ravi Zacharias Ministries issue, there were probably years that people gave to his ministry where they didn't know what was going on. And maybe they felt like God was leading them to support that ministry. And and maybe that was wrong or maybe that was right. I I, I can't judge that. But what I can say is that once people know that there is an issue, I think that there is an obligation there to at least do the research to figure it out, you know, what's going on. You know, there's a there's sort of a standard in the nonprofit industry 
Uh, and I don't think that this applies to churches necessarily, but it applies to, you know, missions, organizations and things like that, um, where you want to see that people get, uh, give more than 80 percent of their income, uh, their contributions to people who are receiving the product, whatever it is. So so if I'm giving to like a, an African mission, you know, I don't want 50 percent of that to be overhead, you know, to be you know, the CEO is getting million dollar a year salary and he's got 17 assistants that are all making really, you know, six figure salaries. And, and only half of that money is really going to Africa to, to do, you know, wells or do Bibles or do whatever it might be doing. And so I think there is an, an obligation for us to do some research and to look into the organizations that we support. For example, the organization I mentioned earlier uh, in, in, in Louisville that helps the homeless, you know, that we've looked into that organization and they're a Christian organization and everything looked good. And so we view that as part of our giving to the poor in our local community, but we did the research beforehand and, and, and made sure it checked all the boxes that we were looking at. So those are the kinds of things that I, I look at from my perspective. If you're attending a church where the guy has a, a private jet, I would just issue a, a warning that that doesn't seem to line up with what the New Testament pastor to me looks like. Um, again, I'm not here to judge. There are some people out there that are independently wealthy and I have no business knowing their personal financial information, but I would say that'd be a red flag for me if someone has a, a, a private jet or uh, an opulent lifestyle. I think that would, that would raise a lot of red flags for me personally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are there are wealthy people. That is true. That's a good point you raise. Uh, that are huge givers and still have an opulent lifestyle. That's kind of a a, a separate subject than what we're talking. It doesn't tend often to be the case that those people are in ministry. <laughs> in fact, uh, uh, those, those who I know who are full-time in ministry tend to be pretty close to the poverty line in this country. I honestly think that's one of the greatest tragedies of church congregations throughout this land, that they keep their ministers in poverty rather than paying the person a, a living wage, you know, not not to make them upper class where, you know, they, they use... Uh, Instead of toilet paper, they use silk handkerchiefs to wipe their butt or something. You know, we're not talking about anything crazy here, but just like somewhere in the middle of where the congregation is, if you're part of a wealthy congregation in, in, a, in a big city, then that might be a six-figure income. And sure. in, in that context, you're not rich, just keeping up with everybody else. And if you're way in some rural area— uh, it might be a, a very low amount, but you're still within the range of the people that you're you're serving. So I mean, there's, there's a lot of a lot of things to think about here as far as that goes. But uh, I think people do need to do their diligence in researching ministries that they they support. Uh, but at the same time, in the end, you know, you can't control. You can't. I mean, this whole thing with Ravi Zacharias up until like 2017, nobody had a clue. The way things were handled in 2017, 2018, it still wasn't clear that this lady was telling the truth or that it was legit or not. But I tell you what, now it is clear. <laughs> of course, he's already deceased, so it's kind of a moot point. But, you know, I think you, you, you do the right thing as much as you can and do your due diligence as much as you can as well. And I would say talk to the guys. If it's a pastor who's married, talk to his wife. <laughs> Because the wife will always tell you the truth. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just half joking there. Because I mean, who knows if you can access somebody's wife? Now you're all gonna all my uh, all the people listening to this are gonna now try to contact my wife. Unbelievable! Look what I just did to myself, Will. I'm gonna friend her right now. I've got my phone right here. I'm gonna send her a uh, message here. On Facebook. <laughs> Oh, boy. Anyhow, uh, thank you so much for this series. I feel like there are so many other questions I I didn't even think of while we were going through this that people are going to have. So uh, hopefully we can carry on more dialogue online after the fact. Uh, But uh, is there anything else that you would like to to say maybe to somebody who whose world you just shattered by saying that you don't have to tithe anymore? And they're like, but 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 uh, what would you how would you like to conclude? Yeah. So, you know, like I said, it can be sort of a jarring thing to consider that, that idea. Again, I like to focus on the positives. I would tell this person, think about this in the old Testament time, not everyone had the spirit. So God had to, he had to tell them how to give, 
when to give, how much to give, to whom to give, you know, all those boxes had to get checked off. But here we sit on the other side of, of the cross, on the other side of Pentecost. And in the post-Pentecost church, we all have the spirit. So God can lead us how to give, when to give, how much to give, and to whom. And I just think that's such an exciting thing to think about is we can partner with the God who owns everything while we're stewarding the things that he gave us. And that's what I would leave that person with, I think. All right. Very good. Well, thanks for your time. Thank you, Sean. Well, that's it for this episode. If you'd like to get in touch with Will Barlow, you can do that by coming online to Restitutio. Look for episode 386, Christian Giving Today, and leave a comment or question there. Or you can reach out to him through his website, studydrivenfaith.org, and also see some of his other audio and written resources there that you may enjoy. On our last episode, episode 385, Giving in the New Testament, Elaine wrote in saying, Quite enjoyed these two podcasts with Will Barlow. A few days earlier, I heard an interesting podcast on Stuff You Missed in History Class about Hildegard of Disabodenberg. I hope I said that correctly. Supposedly, Hildegard was the 10th child and was dedicated to God slash the church by her parents as a form of tithe. Could you imagine tithing your 10th child today? <laughs> Wondering if Will had come across this practice of the Middle Ages. I, I don't think Will has. Uh, hopefully, none of us has come across this practice. You're not supposed to tithe people. Even in the strictest observance of the Old Testament, There is no mention of tithing people to the church. There was, however, the sense that the firstborn son of every family did belong to God and that that child was to be redeemed by uh, making a special offering for that child. But there's nothing about sending the child off to live at the church, although Hannah did that, didn't she? Uh, But that was totally up to her. That was her decision. She said that, if God, if you will give me a child, I will dedicate him to your service. And that's how Samuel got his start. So maybe I shouldn't bash it too much, but it sure does seem like a strange practice. Thanks for writing in and giving us that little tidbit from history. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to support this ministry, you can contribute at restitutio.org. We'll catch you next week. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.